Hey ladies and gents, welcome to the Controlled Interest Gamecast, where we talk about video games and everything happening in the industry. As always, I'm joined by Dom. Jared, it's an honor to be here with you today, and with Tanner. It's just a great honor. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Dom kind of spoiled the surprise there. We got our first-time guest, staff writer over at Dual Shockers, Tanner Pierce. How's it going? Hey, how's it going, everybody? We've had Logan on the show before, uh, one of the leads over there at Dual Shockers, so wanted to bring on some more people. Website's really good. Uh, later in the episode, we'll talk about the DualSense controller, but uh, before the show, we were talking about the uh, social media reaction you guys had, and it was really solid. Uh, yeah. <laughs> as as a website branded as DualShocker, you know, the rebrand of the official PlayStation controller is uh, an apt time to make some jokes at your own expense, so that was really cool to see. Absolutely. As far as I'm still aware, we still have dual sensors as our name on Twitter right now. I, I'm not entirely <laughs> sure, but I'm almost positive that's still on the site <laughs> or, or at least on our Twitter account. It's not on the site. You guys even jumped on the URL, too. You guys snatched that up, <laughs> dualsensors.com. It's so funny. Uh, we, yeah, our, our, one of our co-founders, Joel, uh, he, he sent us a screenshot. I, I'm not joking you, probably about five minutes after the announcement came out that just said that he trademarked the site or he registered the domain, I should say for dualsensors.com, which I thought was absolutely hilarious, but really smart future proofing too. If, if it does end up, you know, if the next, if the PlayStation yeah. six has the dual sense too, you know, you never know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that would be future looking. So this week in news, we're going to be tackling some, like we previously mentioned the dual sense IGN summer of gaming amongst a couple of other things. But let's hop into this quick news here. Uh, this, I didn't actually do in the write-up. This is something that came about later on during the day as we're recording here on April 9th. A surprise uh, news story for us? Shit. Uh, I mean, not it's ready. not crazy crazy, but CD Projekt Red had a investor meeting where they were basically talking about their plans for Cyberpunk 2077. Among those things that they talked, they kind of reaffirmed that the game is set for its September release. Obviously, given the current situation with all of these games being delayed and the work from home affecting, you know, the speed in which these games can be developed, there's a little bit of caution as to whether or not this game is going to be hitting this fall. And they kind of doubled down saying like, hey, the game's pretty much done. We're squashing bugs and doing that stuff. We pretty much just need certification at this point. And... That's not too surprising. This game's so far out. I mean, we still don't know how this whole coronavirus pandemic is going to affect us moving forward, but it seems like there's a, a safe enough barrier there so it wouldn't be affected. That's not really surprising. The other stuff I wanted to talk about was specifically, uh, they talked about the next-gen version of the game, right? And they mentioned that the free upgrade was going to be happening on the Series X, which we already know about via smart delivery. So essentially, September comes around, you buy Cyberpunk 2077 for your Xbox One, when the next gen version becomes available on the Xbox One X, you get the free upgrade. You don't have to buy the game again, right? You get to play the best version of that game for free, which isn't too surprising for CD Projekt Red and the way they kind of do things. They mentioned that they're that the PS5 was going to have a separate SKU. Now people jumped on this right away and were like, "Oh, does that mean we have to pay for it twice?" Not necessarily. Like we don't know PlayStation's plan moving forward with this. Like they haven't announced if they're doing a similar system, right? Uh, as smart delivery, it's. It's going to be really bad if they don't. And I kind of want to get your guys' opinions on that. Like, if it comes to the point where when the console's finally re revealed for the PlayStation 5 and they don't have the smart delivery system and gamers are forced to decide, do I wait for Cyberpunk to get with my PS5 or do I just have to buy it twice? What do you guys think about that? Like, the likelihood of Sony doing something like that? Man, I would think unlikely, but I guess you never really know. Ultimately, because it wouldn't necessarily be up to... That would be uh, CD Projekt Red's decision, right? If they wanted to charge, you know, for a separate upgrade uh, or not, I would think. Um, well, I, it's weird because it, if it's a separate SKU, right, then I, I don't know how that exactly gets handled in the back end because would they just offer, like, a free redemption key for customers or is it, like, a, a mandated thing by PlayStation where that's not actually possible? You know what I mean? Like... If CD yeah. Projekt Red wants to do something like this, but it's not built into the back end for Sony, um, yeah, it's 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 very interesting. It, this is part of the reason why us not knowing as much about the PlayStation 5 as we do the Xbox Series X at this point, this is like a negative PR for Sony without them really doing anything. You know what I mean? And it's not their fault necessarily, uh, but CD Projekt Red, because they are partners with PlayStation as well, they don't want to speak out of turn one way or another, and they don't want to take yeah. the messaging from Sony. So, like, so. that would mean 
because CD Projekt Red came out and said, and they were really adamant about like, yeah, people shouldn't have to buy the game twice. If you make an upgrade, people should get it for free. So I would think that, you know, they went in with that approach and Sony would have had to have said, no, we're not going to let you do that on our platform. We're not going to let you give away a free upgrade. And that would, that would be crazy to me if that's, if that's what Sony did. So I hope not. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, so this whole thing in terms of the smart delivery and upgrades and stuff like that, personally, I think it's been a bit confusing on both ends. Um, but you know, it seems like CD Projekt Red wants to do it. At the same time, I also think that Sony knows, like, if they don't do it, yeah. that'd be terrible for Bad them. Look. <laughs> yeah, that'd be terrible yeah. for them. Like, I, 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 I have to hope that they're smart enough to realize that. So, I, I at the very least hope that they go and they do a similar thing. Um, but I mean, I, I, I would assume they would. Because I would also assume that they know as much that it would look bad. But then again, Sony has been, you know, kind of screwing up lately in terms of messaging and stuff like that. Yeah. So you never know. Actually, I'd I mean, say they definitely will because they, that's exactly how they played PS4 Pro. They not only, you know, allowed that, but they encouraged devs to make a, you know, a, a right. patch for games to be, be better on, on the PS4 Pro. So... That would, I guess that would even really shock me if they if they went against that strategy they've already been with. And yeah. it's it's tough because you see these obvious decisions of like, yeah, there's no reason why they shouldn't do that. It'd look terrible. But if you go back there's to 2013 and you're like... Doubt, though. Yeah. yeah, if you go back to 2013, you're like, there's no way Xbox is going to go on stage and just talk about TV for 90% of the conference, right? <laughs> no way they're going to do that. Uh, they did that. So it's like... And especially, Jim Ryan gives me worry with Sony it, just in general because he's not the Sean Laydens of the world. Uh, and he's definitely not a Phil Spencer. Like... He is a guy that's made some comments that don't really line up or make sense, especially when going back all the way to like crossplay for Minecraft. If you guys remember that, saying that they needed to protect their audience from uh, the evil that's out there, which yeah, is it's, it's very ridiculous. odd. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, some some updated news from CD Projekt Red. There was another bit that they said that they're committing to as much DLC as they provided in The Witcher Three for Cyberpunk, which I think Ooh. ended up being sixteen <laughs> individual free updates. Obviously, some larger than others others but yeah oh, just <laughs> committing to that much dlc is great you know I, yeah. these guys are just such good at their they're good at building a community that trusts them and knows that they're not going to get they're going to get their dollar value right which is a question that came up last week with the release of re3 and people wondering is this six to eight hour experience worth sixty dollars you know cyberpunk's going to be worth sixty dollars out the gate on top of post release right so kind of just doubling down on that uh, I, uh, I before we move on really quickly, really, I do have to say, I as much as they're saying it now, I don't believe uh, Cyberpunk is coming in September. I agree. I don't. See I don't. It. I don't yeah. see it right now at all. And now again, if things if things change, for example, uh, and I'm using this as a tangential tangential note, but so Universal Studios, where I also work, is reopening on May 31st. If that's the case. Then and and that's like the hard date for the rest of the world. Like things get back to normal around best that case time, scenario. I say. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like you know things get back to normal around June. You know, I I I I think that's the cutoff point for me because if it takes any longer than that, I don't know how they're going to be able to make this game go gold. You know, through June, July, and then August, because you know you have to assume that their game would go gold by mid August if it's coming out mid September. So, I I just don't I don't see I don't see it happening as it, it just, as it's going on right now. It just seems like the world like the past week like me and Jared actually talked about this a while ago where we kind of we both agree that we we think it still is likely that they hit September. But the, every week like I'm looking around at the world and it seems like it, things only get seem to get worse. And I don't know. It's kind of I mean, maybe it's just I'm a bit spooked right now. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm I mean I, to doubt I, it, but it, it seems like we're going to be peaking soon, which is good. Um, because that means, you know, the sooner we peak, the sooner the world goes back to normal. Um, so that, that's the thing. If, if the world is not back to normal or at least the United States isn't back to normal by, you know, end of, uh, end of May, early June, I, j I just can't see it happening. Yeah, I, I'm still, I guess I'm, a, I'm against you guys on that. I still believe it can hit September pretty strongly, but I do think that. 
if it is to your point, if it doesn't end up, this whole thing doesn't end as quickly as everyone's assuming it will. I do think there's a world in which they they work with Warner Brothers, who I believe is a publishing partner in in the West, to mm. kind of do the Final Fantasy thing where they start shipping out, like getting everything shipped out earlier, right? right but it's going to be the right. opposite of why Square Enix did it. So Square Enix was shipping it early because things were going to get halted, right? And I think mm-hmm. Warner Brothers might start the process early as things are picking up before they go full gear, so they can just start distributing at a smaller pace and work up to the full pace. But um. Maybe. And the thing, too, is they, they're they so confident about being done with the game. And I do think, as great as Witcher 3 was, it did release with a lot of bugs that had to get squashed. And with them saying the game's already done, it, it's tough. It's just like, I don't know how much they're going to commit to digital versus retail and where retail's at at that point. We'll see, though. Right. It's it's a tough call to make because we've never been. It's unprecedented, yeah. right? We don't know what's yeah. going to happen. And, and uh, the situation's changing every day, too, so... Exactly. It can escalate or de-escalate quicker uh, or slower than we thought. We don't know. Uh, next up. So trusted Twitter follow and industry insider Shinobi602. If you're not following him, please do. He tweets some incredible video game screenshots. Just like a swell follow on Twitter. He, he's also a fellow Orlando uh, Orlando citizen like me. <laughs> Orlando. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so he was on Reset Era, and he was asked. He's he's a known insider, so he, people understand that he has information that isn't really privy to the public. Somebody asked for a tease because he said at, at some point he was really excited for next gen, specifically Xbox, and he revealed on there that uh, in terms of what's coming from Xbox, he vaguely described it as gorgeous fantasy worlds, reboots, and big sci-fi. He prefaced this by saying it's not his place to like reveal everything, which is. A really respectable position because, as we'll get into the next story, when people know things about video games, they tend to leak them for their own like personal pride or popularity, right? Mm-hmm. So he was basically just saying like, "Hey, I don't want to take their messaging from them. I'm just some dude, but here's what you can expect." Obviously, people started reading into that, especially the word reboot, right? It's like, "Oh, what does that mean? Is that Fable? Is that Banjo? What is that?" And then he also stated that we shouldn't have to wait much longer to see what's coming. My assumption, the way I read this, was E3, right? Now, Mm. people started getting very hyperbolic because IGN, on their most recent episode of Unlocked, their Xbox podcast, Miranda Sanchez, who's an editor there, frequent contributor to their wiki team, she said that on Tuesday of the following week, which is going to be, what is that, the, like, 13th or something, that there's going to be something that Xbox fans should check out on their site, Right? In regards to the thing she's posting. Now, people started being very hyperbolic and putting these two, two things together. Of like, oh my god, there's going to be a game reveal by IGN on Tuesday. I think that's dumb. That doesn't make sense. My assumption is that announcement on Tuesday has to do with something we're going to talk about later, which is IGN Summer Gaming. Maybe there's a partnership there, right? I, I'm, I'm assuming you guys are in agreement with me. There, there's no way that Xbox is going to unveil one of their next-gen games on IGN on an IGN article. Right? No, I, I don't. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense at all. That'd yeah. Be silly. Uh, and in terms of his quote here, so he said, "Gorgeous fantasy worlds." To me, that's like all the RPGs that are in development from, you know, Obsidian and uh, what's the other studio they purchased? Um, in Exile. In Exile. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, in Exile. The reboot thing, my assumption is the Fable, right? The worst kept secret in gaming at this point being worked on by Playground Games. And then big sci-fi is Halo, obviously. Um, yeah, I just wanted to touch on that because people are being very hyperbolic of like, are we seeing this next Tuesday? And it's like, no, dude, we're not. It's, I don't. No. People on Twitter get too crazy sometimes, especially when just yeah. like a, an announcement for an announcement is announced. <laughs> they just minds run wild. Uh That was one quote-unquote leaker rumor spreader. This next one is a story that was corroborated by Video Games Chronicle. Uh, There's this guy named Dust Golem, who's like a well-known, infamous Resident Evil leaker. He's done a lot of stuff right in the past in terms of both of the remakes as well as RE7. And they kind of went with his details and added a little bit to it, and here's what it is for Resident Evil 8. So the game is set to release in 2021. Some sources say Q1, others say just 2021. At this point, like we talked about with COVID-19, who knows <laughs> when it's going to release. Yeah. Uh, but the additional details here are pretty interesting. So the protagonist for the game is going to be Ethan Winters, who, if that name doesn't sound familiar in regards to Resident Evil, he was the protag for RE7. Um, kind of played down. He doesn't really have the caricature of a lot of the other 
characters in the franchise. Speaking of those other characters, though, Chris Redfield will apparently play a central role in the game. Uh, spoiler alert for a game that's like, when did RE7 come out? Three years ago? Four years ago? Yeah. yeah. Was it? What, oh my gosh, was it that long ago? I remember being in the theater and seeing that announcement and losing my <laughs> mind, but it doesn't feel like that long ago. <laughs> he he appears at the end of that game, so it's no surprise that he'd be here joining Ethan Winters once again. Uh, they mentioned a redesign. So now, I don't know if they're referencing, because he was already like partially redesigned in RE7 from his original look. So I don't know if it's just like them reconfirming like, yeah, it's not the OG Chris Redfield, it's a new redesign. Or if this is like another redesign on top of that, isn't really clear there. Uh, it's going to have a European setting with hints of fantasy. So there's going to be a new stalker enemy type that's, you know, uh, similar to witches. And then they mentioned armored zombies, <laughs> which is odd. There's also some mentions of werewolves. Uh, it's going to be named RE8 Village. So the V-I-L-L. -L, knock off the little stubs on the L's. So it's going to be like an 8, right? V-I-I-I -I -I in Roman numerals. <laughs> that one's the, like the one part of this rumor that I think is like corny. But it's Capcom, so you like never know. Especially the way they did the Resident Evil 7 reveal. Remember, it was uh, yep. Biohazard, right? And then it was the 7 in that. I, and I, 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 I remember that distinctly being like, what? Seven? What is that? Oh, it's Resident Evil Seven. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, because yeah. that was because the trailer or whatever was like first person, right? So you didn't think yeah. Resident Evil at all, and then it was yeah when it finally yeah. kind of became obvious. You're like, oh, people realizing after person. months that the yeah. kitchen demo they're playing Resident Evil, right? It's like, oh, sick. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, it's going to feature hallucinations and insanity. Uh, kind of those are going to be mechanics in the game to some extent, uh, similar to like an Outlast or. Uh, Amnesia, if you guys ever played that horror game. Uh, originally, it was supposed to be Revelations 3, but positive internal testing led the pivot to making it the main, the next mainline entry, uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, I guess from all of this, I think we're mixed levels of Resident Evil fandom. I'm, I, I like Resident Evil, but I'm not like a super fan. I think this looks cool, uh, or sounds cool rather. The European setting is weird with like the armored zombies and stuff. I don't know how that's going to play with hardcore resident evil fans like how they're going to explain that away um but it sounds interesting and i'm down to see a reveal of it i don't know what you guys think of all these uh rumors yeah i'm in that sounds dope yeah uh, so this is might shock some people i have never played a resident evil game in my life wow um, oh well i have i have i have i played the demo for seven when it when that came out on ps4 uh, and I loved it, and I've always wanted to pick up, especially seven, because I've heard great things about that. Um, but I just I've never had the time to sit down, and and it's not even like a horror thing. I love horror. That's probably my favorite genre of movies, games, whatever, when it's done right. But I've just never had the time to sit down and play a Resident Evil game. So, you know, I I, I am looking to get into the series, uh, and considering they're doing remakes of every single game. Uh, as well as new entries, uh, I'm I'm excited to get into it. So yeah, I I think they need to do a, another remake for RE1. So I like I said, I'm not a huge fan. I went to try and play the most recent RE1 remake, it's and whack. the tank the tank controls I just still can't do it. The fixed camera angle stuff like yeah. it just doesn't hold up to me. And I know it's gonna sound blasphemous to like hardcore Resident Evil fans, right? Because they love that stuff. But I do think it's one of those things where if you grow up playing it, it's ingrained in your mind as a good time and you just understand it naturally. Whereas somebody who didn't play that and is going back to it, it just really feels dated. Um, Man, I I'll second that because uh, that was a... I think that was a free PS Plus game at some point, so I have it. Um, but I, yeah, I tried yeah Resident Evil 1, 2, and I was just like, ah, I can't this but not, you know as much as i love newer <laughs> games and this is just and and to be honest um I, lo I remember loving resident evil 4 uh when i was a kid too and i tried to go back and play that and that like it's not tank controls but it's it's still not uh it's still not modern because you have to like you get the walk, stop to shoot then, right exactly and that's what it was that was like oh i can't do this because you have to stop and then you can aim and shoot and only then and that just like uh, i get how it kind of adds to you know the feeling feeling of like oh i you know it's hard it's hard to navigate and shoot zombies and there's a lot going on and they're slow but it's hard to go back to old mechanics like that sometimes it's gonna be so two and three were beloved two a lot more than three four is obviously considered the best in the franchise and one of the best games of all time when they get to the remix of five and six 
that's going to be really interesting because those games are so divisive, especially six, right? So I wonder how drastically those are changed because with two, three, four, they don't want to tweak too much because they don't want to piss off the audience and those games are already pretty good in their own right. But with five and six, it's like no one really loves them that much. So it seems like they'll have more creative freedom there. It's just intriguing to see what they end up doing with that when they eventually get there. Um, but who knows if RE4 is even the next remake. People want Code Veronica next, uh, which is like a spin-off title. Um, so we'll see what happens there. Next up, the ESA, the beloved ESA. I'm saying that sarcastically for people who can't read the pitch of my voice. Mm -hmm. uh, has confirmed that they will not be hosting an E3 digital replacement, but will return in 2021 with their reimagined E3 event. Uh, this is not surprising. We assume that they might end up getting the publishers together and kind of just brand some like week-long digital thing as E3 online or whatever, right? But it seems like, and the ESA won't say this, uh, publishers probably just were like, no, we'll just do our own thing. On top of the new next story we'll get into, which is IGN Summer of Gaming, a lot of these publishers already partnered with IGN because it seems like they're a little bit more proactive on it. I mean, even Gamescom was more proactive than E3 or the ESA was in terms of having a replacement to their event or having clear messaging, right? Because Gamescom's still going to happen. They said they want to still do physical and digital, but they're unclear what's going to happen. Uh, it just seems like the ESA was twiddling their thumbs as they're known to do. People think that them not doing something this year means it's definitively gone next year. I don't think so. I'm hopeful that E3 returns to something that people want to attend and publishers want to be a part of, but who knows? Um, I don't know if you guys have anything to say about this specifically or if you guys want to head into the IGN part of this. Because, like, this part, I don't know, the ESA not doing something isn't surprising, right? It's kind of what you we know, expect from them. Kind of saw it coming. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. E3 is kind of dead to me um, <laughs> right now, but that's a whole other conversation. But, no, this doesn't really surprise me. Yeah, so yeah, okay, you did what we thought you were going to do, all right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> ne next up, the more interesting thing here, IGN Summer of Gaming, so this is via IGN.com, they had their own official announcement for this, and it reads, IGN is proud to announce our new Summer of Gaming event, a global digital event set to begin this June to bring you the latest news and impressions around upcoming games in the next generation of console hardware. IGN will be collaborating with a number of partners for the Summer of Gaming, including 2K, Square Enix, Sega, Bandai Namco, Amazon, Google Stadia, Twitter, Devolver Digital, THQ Nordic, and more. Expect more details in the coming weeks. The event will include live broadcasts and on-demand programming featuring IGN's editorial coverage of the work of game developers from around the world. Now, before we get into that, I want to give this last quote from the general manager at IGN. This was Yale Prow. Uh, more and more people are turning towards video games for entertainment and escapism. Last week, we saw new records for traffic across all platforms. We're excited to bring this global digital event to our audience and partners, as this will be an event not to be missed. So, seems like IGN kind of handled the replacement for this. Makes sense. They're the biggest presence at E3 in terms of covering it, right, from a media standpoint. So, they were the ones best situated to kind of take it on their shoulders, present the stuff. It's unclear. So, the way they word it, live broadcast and on-demand programming... I want to know from you guys what you think this will actually be. My hope is that it's kind of what we expect where it's IGN pre-show, then, you know, a specific partner presentation, and then an IGN post-show, and then maybe some, like, Nintendo Treehouse-style thing where they have hands-on demos or online demos or whatever. Um, what do you guys expect this to specifically be, like their presentation? Honestly, kind of what you just described, I pictured like Nintendo's E3 model as of late, right? Where there, um, there's some pre-show stuff, or just some people talking about this or that, um, and then more of a focused direct style kind of stream, um, followed by some like gameplay of random demos or whatever it is. That's kind of what I figured. It'd just be obviously be a smattering of uh, publishers involved or different games, things like that. Uh, I'm more curious about like, what kind of like what kind of reveals or what kind of stuff like that uh, do they land? I guess. Well, yeah, because it's like, and before we get to you, Tanner, real quick, do yeah. these partners have stuff that they're specifically holding for Nintendo, Sony, and Xbox for their own things, 
or are they going to double dip again, right? Because in years past, we see Kingdom Hearts at literally every press conference without the game audio, which was lovely. You know what I mean? Or is it they hold it for one thing, so like Square Enix, right? Say they want to show something new for Marvel's Avengers. Do they do that for IGN's thing? Or was Xbox like, no, we want you to show the Xbox Series X version of that, right? Or uh, Activision, for instance, they're like, oh, we want to show the new Call of Duty. We have a partnership with Sony, so the first time you see this year's Call of Duty will be at the PlayStation 5 reveal event. We can't really show something at the IGN thing, right? So what do you think, Tanner? Do you think there's going to be some weird, like, bartering in terms of what they're going to be showing? Or do you think, at the end of the day, at least Nintendo and Xbox of the big three will be a part of this as well? Uh, I don't... Personally, I don't see Xbox, Nintendo, or PlayStation being a part of this whole thing. I think this is... I think this is meant for. I'm. I, I don't know if I want to. I don't know if I want to restrict or edit, restrict it or anything. But I think it, this is for the people who want to have an avenue for, uh, for announcements that wouldn't already have it or wouldn't have a popular avenue. I guess so. Like yeah. PlayStation obviously has an avenue. Xbox has an avenue. Nintendo has an avenue. Activision has an avenue through PlayStation. I mean, they ha- they've had a partnership with PlayStation, so they're probably going to reveal new Call of Duty stuff. Uh, through PlayStation, even though I don't think that game's coming this year, um, they're they're probably going to reveal new Call of Duty stuff through PlayStation, um, you know. And I think all the different third party um, publishers who have deals with these bigger people like PlayStation, and Xbox, they'll put their announcements through there. But for everybody else, I I do think the majority of the industry will be going through this this summer event. Yeah. Um, Here's a weird thing, though, I wanted to mention to you guys. So, a name that's not on this list is Bethesda, right? And we know probably the reason why is because Pete Hines came out and said, hey, we're not doing anything to replace E3. Now, to me, uh, Dom and I talked about this last week, uh, Tanner, that it seems like they probably didn't have enough to warrant them doing a show, right? They probably have something to show. I wouldn't doubt it. Some some next-gen reveal, whether it's Starfield or something else, maybe the next Wolfenstein Um, to me, it's like, maybe they didn't have enough to do their own event. They also didn't have enough to join this IGN thing, because I guarantee you IGN approached them, right? They approach all these publishers. And I I, I would not be surprised if IGN didn't contact everyone. Yeah. I mean, they contacted Devolver Digital, which no shade to them. They're a great publishing house, but they are on the (laughs) smaller end, you know, in comparison to all these big guys. I wonder if Bethesda had like literally, okay, we can hold off. We don't have to worry about stuff. Our team, let's have them focus on creating, like, one vertical slice asset. We'll put that at Xbox. And the only reason I'm saying Xbox is Bethesda has a long-running working relationship with Bethesda. uh, With Xbox, sorry. We saw Fallout 4 there, 76, yada, yada, yada. Uh, So I wonder if they have, like, one thing. They're like, let's focus on this one vertical slice. Get that to Xbox. They can worry about that. And we're just going to kind of take the year, not off, but, you know, like, slow down and focus and make sure we're not doing things that are out of our hands with the current situation. So I just thought Bethesda was a weird middle thing because it's like they're not one of the big three that you'd easily expect not to be a part of it. They also announced they're not doing something. So it's like, where do they fall? They're not going to go a year without showing something. They said they're going to reveal stuff. Um, Yeah, they're in a very odd predicament. Maybe they'll do... I I don't want to compare it to PlayStation, but maybe they'll just do like, you know, last year PlayStation did a lot of state of plays. Maybe they'll do something similar where... They do little sprinkles of stuff all throughout the year uh, where yeah. they show off stuff. You know, that way they don't have to condense something into, like, a 10-minute showcase. And they also don't have to fill it into, like, an hour-long showcase for somebody else. So maybe they'll just sprinkle things throughout the year. Well, even to get to their individual audiences, right, they can upload a video that's a 10-minute deep dive into the next Elder Scrolls Online expansion. And that audience will watch that. And the people who aren't interested don't have to watch that, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> But they're bi- they're gonna have something big to show because they always have at least one big thing on you know about set ready to release and I think that big thing won't be in one of these individual announcements it will be at you know one of these big three tentpole things we'll see I don't know it's but this is in a weird place right now and so the, going back to the thing when I was talking about Miranda Sanchez talking about she has something very interesting for Xbox listeners on Tuesday. You're of the mind, Tanner, that you don't think they're joining this. I'm of that mind, too. I think Xbox, because they're handling their own console thing, and they probably are going to work with IGN to some extent of like, hey, this is when we're going, so you have a heads up, but we're not going to be in partnership with you, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Right. 
what do you guys think that Tuesday thing is? Do you think it's like a weird new feature that IGN got a first look at? Because remember, Phil Spencer was on Unlocked. He was on their next-gen console watch thing. He was supposed to fly down when GDC was happening. And even when GDC was canceled before the lockdown happened, he was still planned to go down there anyways. So it seems to me like they're going to have an exclusive reveal of something. Like we said, definitely not a game. Do you think it's like a, a feature or a mechanic or like something yeah. that we're not thinking of? My my on the spot theory is that maybe they're going to get some kind of technical deep dive like Wired had with PlayStation earlier in the year for PS5. Maybe they'll have something similar to that. Um, but I don't know what else there would be left to reveal for hardware wise, so I'm not really sure. And that we're also be, assuming, the, sorry, we're also assuming it's yeah. Xbox Series X related, which that yeah. it could be maybe a new. One thing I just thought of is, remember the Battletoads remaster that was announced? That still doesn't have a date. <laughs> and to Xbox I, fans, that could be something yeah. that like, because she specifically said Xbox fans would be excited on an unlocked podcast, right? This wasn't like a mainline thing. This was for like Xbox Xbox fans. So like, I could even see it being a release date for that game, as like mm. non exciting as that is. It, I think people are kind of blowing this out of the water because I, I think it could run the gamut of like something Series X related or just an announcement for a game or what if she just writes a thing about how Gears Tactics, they got the release date for console, right? I don't know. It could be something really yeah. not that crazy. Yeah. Yeah. What do you I, think, Dom? I feel like, I f well, really quickly before Dom goes, I feel like if yeah. it was anything big, they would be hyping it up more. Or it would be Xbox officially doing it on their own site. It wouldn't be IGN. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's it. I think it's probably uh, Knights of the Old Republic remastered as an Xbox exclusive. <laughs> just going subtly on the IGN website, just going up yeah. at two in the afternoon. Nice little article. Yep. Yep. <laughs> they're gonna Actually, pull, they're gonna pull a dual sense. <laughs> they're just yeah, gonna think, drop it. I think it'll be um, uh, Elder Scrolls Six reveal trailer, and within that trailer, there will be God. a hidden TV <laughs> that simultaneously is releasing or uh, announcing. Kotor remastered, so it's like Inception. Of, no, I think obviously that couldn't be more ridiculous. I think it's probably something smaller, um, uh, being that you know the the avenue that we're talking about here is like a, a smaller IGN thing. So I, yeah, I could see something like Battle Toads or like a you know, one of those other like Xbox properties. Like, I don't know Fusion Frenzy. You know, I don't. Know, like, <laughs> I know uh, people that would lose their minds for Fusion Frenzy. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I wasn't. Same thing with Battletoads. That wasn't necessarily a dig, even it kind of sounded like it. But like something where, <laughs> yeah, a group of people would be really pumped about it, um, and it's a great yeah. thing. But not necessarily, you know, Knights of the Old Republic remastered. Like big, so. people for, I mean, it's not as big as Mario Party, but that was a generation of kids Mario Party. Like, oh yeah, obviously not to the same extent. It's not like it's not Mario Party level, but yeah, it's it's really interesting the love that 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 franchise has. Uh, let's hop over to this DualSense news. So if you're wondering, mm -hmm. DualSense, what the hell is that? Well, folks, that's the DualShock 5, or at least what it's planning to be. It's the controller for the PlayStation 5. So PlayStation announced their controller for the PS5, titled the DualSense. Uh, on top of a rebrand, the controller also sports a suite of new additions, which we'll sh talk about shortly. The one thing I wanted to mention real quick is this announcement came an hour before the Inside Xbox stream happened, and... The weird thing was, I don't know if you guys are paying attention to Twitter, but the moment this was announced, for the rest of the day, the number one trending thing on Twitter was Xbox controller, which was pretty <laughs> hilarious. So I wouldn't say, like, quote-unquote backfired, right? But it is odd that, like, the PlayStation controller is announced and then Xbox controller is trending because of what we'll get into in terms of the design of the controller itself. Let's go over some of these new additions, and then we'll give our own personal takes on what we liked and disliked about the controller and all of that. So, it's going to come with haptic feedback and adaptive triggers. This is something that they've talked about in the past in the Wired articles. It's a great new addition. Uh, it's something that the Xbox controller has had for a while. Um, and it's kind of weird that the, the DualShock, or at least now the DualSense, hasn't had that yet. But it just it makes the gameplay experience that much better, and it's... It's one of those features that, like, yeah, duh, that should be a part of it. But in hindsight, it's weird that it wasn't. I don't know. It's it's also one of those things, sadly, that it only is as good as the developers make it, right? So if developers use the tools and implement it in their game, it's going to be incredible. But that's if they want to, right? For Xbox, they've had this feature in their controller, both of these features, forever. 
And the real true shining example of it is Forza, right? That mm. it takes full advantage of that. There's other titles, but it's in a sweeping thing that's kind of like default on all games. So as awesome as this is, this is one of those things that like hopefully PlayStation's first parties take advantage of this. I hope Spider Man, you know, your whatever's next from Naughty Dog, but yeah, it's it's uh it's awesome, but who knows how it's going to be used? Yeah, but that's that's a good point though. So Xbox already has uh, that in the triggers. Yeah, the haptic feedback. Yeah. yeah, so that's good though. So now that both consoles will have it, um, that's Ooh, a good point. Chance that yeah developers will use it right because like a lot of features are like you know like the uh, DualShock DualShock Four touchpad right that barely got <laughs> utilized because. Well, they have to make the same game work on Xbox too, which doesn't have the touchpad. So, like, why are they going to spend a bunch of time using that when it doesn't really? Not not a great example because that didn't add much ever anyway. But uh, hey, I like my touchpad. Cool. <laughs> yeah, it's it's cool. I like it enough, but yeah, it kind of felt like they never. No one really, yeah. really, you know, made full use out of it. Um, yeah. But maybe for these triggers, uh, this feed, haptic feedback, whatever they're calling it, uh, mm-hmm. on both consoles, that'll encourage. Uh, developers to start using it in more creative ways because then the other part too is people on PC uh, are going to start probably buying the, you know these new controllers and using them for uh, PC gaming too so it would be even bigger audience uh, all mm-hmm. the way around so hopefully that leads to more creativity with this stuff yeah yeah I, I'm I am the, the, you know I, I've I have very strong opinions about the dual sense but this is one of the things about the dual sense that I, that genuinely gets me really excited because i i love the idea of haptic feedback um and i love the idea of 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 all this so um yeah that's the one thing about the dual sense where i i i give a strong two thumbs up <laughs> uh next up so this one's kind of tough to explain to listeners you have to pull up an image of, of the, the controller itself to understand what I'm saying, but the silhouette of the controller itself has changed. It's rounded handles, so it's more like part of like a st- uh, rounded out as opposed to with the DualShock 4, it's a lot more of vertical lines down the sides of the controller. Um, they're kind of like tubes, whereas this takes the Xbox controller shape a little bit more where it's more of a V, right, as opposed to like a straight tube. And uh, it's it's very similar to both the Xbox controller and the, the Nintendo Pro controller, um, which I, as somebody who primarily plays on Xbox, am happy about because I've always felt the DualShock to be uncomfortable, but obviously it's a preference because you're going to be more comfortable with the controller you use the most, right? That's just how it works. Um, I know, Tanner, you on the other hand, <laughs> you have some thoughts on this. I... <sighs> Look... <laughs> I I play on PlayStation e- exclusively, pretty much, except for my Nintendo Switch. Um, I've always played on PlayStation. Um, when they switched from the DualShock 3 style, considering they use that same style for DualShock 2 and 1, uh, when they switched from that to the 4, I was excited because as much as I was used to it, I could admit that the 3's design was not very ergonomic, not very fun to use, And the 4's design is a thousand times better than that. I personally think the 4 is the most most comfortable controller on the market. I know a lot of people disagree with that, but that's just how I feel. Um, So seeing this got me upset because it seemed like they were taking cues from the Xbox controller, which, again, if I wanted an Xbox controller... I'd buy an Xbox. I don't really like Xbox as much. Uh, now, the thing that really would have set me off is if they added offset sticks, because I <laughs> hate offset sticks. So I'm just grateful that they kept the inline symmetrical sticks, whatever you want to call it. But this design is I. I mean, I have more problems than just the shape. I can get. I can. I can live with the shape. The shape in and of itself is not the worst part about this controller, in my opinion. Um, But still, I would rather there it would be an evolution of the DualShock 4 design rather than taking cues from the Xbox design. But that's just me. I know a lot of people, like a lot of the people who work at at DualShockers, you know, Logan Moore, for for example, uh, he loves the Xbox 
uh, design for the controller. And I know a lot of other people who love the Xbox design for the controller. So they looked at this and they thought it was amazing. So I completely recognize that I'm in the minority on this, but as a, as a PlayStation fanboy, as some people will say, um, I, I, I just can't get behind this, this, <laughs> this design. <laughs> uh, Next up, you guys talked about it a little bit. So it has a refined touchpad. To me, it's a little less like glaring in the overall design, right? Because the touchpad on the DualShock 4 had like a texture to it, like a surface yeah. to it. Whereas this is more of like a matte, flat plate of armor <laughs> that it looks like. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on top of that, the light bar moves from the back to the front on the sides of the controller. So if you look at a picture of the DualSense, uh, the two like bright blue lights on the left and the right those will change those aren't that color obviously they work with your games to provide visual feedback um i like that placement my worry is just like with the xbox controller with the bright light on the front i wonder how bright those are going to be if you're playing in pitch black like how much will that affect you that's like a minor gripe. I doubt it'll even even be noticeable at that point no that's that's a good point though because that that was a bigger problem on the original DualShock 4, and then I think around when PS4 Pro came out, they put out a revised DualShock 4. But wait, actually, maybe it was just a software update where it started to allow you to change the brightness on the light bar. Either way, you can dim that thing, and so now uh, it's 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 better. So I would assume that for the Dual Sense, they they are aware of that, and it wouldn't be too bright, considering they made that adjustment on DualShock 4. I hope. You know. Yeah. Uh, just like the Series X controller, it's going to support USB-C, finally. I'm yeah. glad that Woo! these controllers are still fi- are going to finally be yeah. using USB-C. And the fact yeah. that both of them did it, thank God. Jesus yeah. Christ. Uh, yeah, that's the, other, that's the other feature that I give a strong two thumbs up for because, you know, who doesn't like USB-C? Like, right. <laughs> USB 2.0, that's who. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, they no. reconfirmed <laughs> that the controllers will have built-in rechargeable batteries. Um, they talked about in the actual blog post yes. how they're working on making them last longer uh which is a huge thank god it's just pro- from what i've heard it's the biggest negative for the dual shock 4 is that the battery life uh is not great and it kind of diminishes and gets worse over time and that's kind of like the balance you play between the two controllers right because like i know a lot of people don't like the fact that you have to buy batteries or you don't have to buy batteries you can buy a rechargeable battery pack but you have that option for the for the xbox of the batteries or the rechargeable pack and then for playstation it comes with an internal battery now the positive and negatives are with the xbox you're going to be spending more money over time in the short term buying batteries or recharging your pack with the playstation controller you're not going to have to spend money as often but there's going to come a point where you're going to have to replace your controller because the battery just sucks right so it's like a give and a take between the two. I personally prefer the battery option because at least I can... I don't have to buy another controller, right? I can just buy new batteries or a different rechargeable pack. Whereas with the PlayStation controller, once that fails, you have to buy another one. I don't think either is better than the other, in my opinion. I think they're both options that some people have preferences over one or the other because they do each have flaws, but yeah. I think like your best option, to me, it's like obvious, is... You split the middle is like your, uh, is if you had an Xbox controller and you had the rechargeable pack, that yeah. as the default, right? So instead of, um, I, because in the 360 days, like nothing was a bigger pain in the ass. I hated like, oh shit, we don't have batteries, we don't even know our double A's, and it's like, especially when we were kids, it's like, well, what do we do? Like we got to beg our parents to drive us to the freaking store to buy a ten dollar <laughs> pack of double A's, or you know what I mean? It was like, <clears throat> and that's <laughs> the. <laughs> That's, That's the best case controller scenario controller of what's breaking. available. I think the best yeah. case scenario, period, would be if both the Xbox and the PlayStation had built-in rechargeable batteries, yes. and then you can replace them once they die. <laughs> yeah, like you exactly. didn't have yeah. to buy a new controller. <laughs> That'd be best. But then you know case that scenario. you know that Sony would charge you sixty dollars for that damn battery pack or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, you think it would be just be sixty? Oh, that's. <laughs> I, I lived through the PlayStation memory card days. I know that they would charge a hundred bucks for that battery pack. <laughs> Uh, so that's good. Like I said, it's more of a preference thing. I, I like the both avenues they're taking. I prefer the Xbox because I'm not forced to buy a new controller, but I'm forced to buy batteries ever so often or my own rechargeable battery pack. So it's like you're spending money either way. It just depends on how you want to spend that money. Uh, the share button on the controller is now the create button. 
the assumption here is that it's basically going to take you to a creator suite in the PlayStation 5 that can get you to editing and posting your stuff on social media. Um, I personally like the like the word create for a button like that as opposed to share. Mm-hmm. I know it's a weird nitpicky thing. Um, but I, I do like the, the idea of uh, kind of inspiring creation as opposed to inspiring sharing. I know that's a weird, like, difference there. I don't know. I just like uh, it being called the create button now. Um kind of clear as to what it does as opposed to just like here share this post on your instagram you know um <laughs> yeah that's cool i think i think you're right like it is important just the naming of it i mean it's written right on there too so that is going to affect you know what people expect of it how people use it because um, yeah it's no longer just like share this screenshot to your twitter feed we assume it'll be something cool like you caught capture that 30 second clip or whatever and then you can to some extent edit it up right on your console right kind of thing we yeah. assume um, which is cool and calling it create you know kind of inspires people to do that um, as, as opposed to just it being the select button the share button and then you know going on so calling it create they're probably going to you know talk about it a lot and try to advertise that feature a lot i assume tanner do you ever find yourself using the share button or is it just not the type of gamer you are uh, i honestly i i use the share button all the time uh, mostly to, to take screenshots. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I will say, I, you know, I, I mostly play first person shooters, call of duty, stuff like that. Um, so uh, just the other day, I mean, I was in Warzone in, in modern warfare and you know, I, a, f- a funny play happened and I was just like, Oh, let me press the share button. And I was able to crop out the last 15 minutes, which was more than enough so yeah, I, I do use it a lot. I like I like the feature, and I'm happy that it's coming back. Same. Uh, lastly, this is probably one of the more divisive things with the controller: the built-in microphone array. Now, looking at it, it's like cool. It's gonna have a built-in microphone. I don't have to scramble for my headset. That being said, I think there are some. First off, the privacy concerns. I know people are worried about that. The funny thing is that you have people complaining that's going to have a built-in microphone and they're tweeting those tweets from their iPhone, right? Which also has huge <laughs> privacy concerns. So it's like, yeah. come on now. Uh, the yeah, thing, but you uh, know, the, the day is going to come where it's like Jason Schreier or whoever is going to oh reveal God. that such developer, you know, was mishandling, you know, their record of people's recordings and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. It happened yeah, with the you Connect. I mean? it happened with exactly. the Connect. So, and it's not like... It's necessarily someone did something wrong. It was just, uh, you know, some negligence and that kind of thing. Yeah. Here's the thing. So, Tanner, as somebody who also plays first-person shooters quite a bit, the -hmm. problem with the built-in microphone on the controller is this. You hop into a match, you're getting ready to play, and you hear the other person on the other line like, Hey, man, you ready to go? (laughs) Let's do this thing. And you're just hearing all of the buttons on the controller. Sorry for listeners. Uh, But, like... That's my one concern. I think this is a cool out-of-the-box feature because it makes it so somebody doesn't have to get the headset. I just don't know how like how much upside there is there because I do see a lot more negatives with it. Um, but yeah, who knows? It's just I'm thinking of worst-case scenario, I guess. Want to know what else is going to happen? There's gonna it's be... also going to drive the price above the controller as well, to some yeah, extent. Because how much? There'll be some knows, marginal but... cost to that microphone yeah. there, of course. Um, but you know what else there was going to be. Um is uh, there's going to be one or two games that do this, right? If you remember back to the DS, a few games, you had to, like, blow into the microphone. So oh, my happen. God, I remember that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you God. know someone's going to do some shit like that with their game, and, and this going to make eyes roll. And it probably won't be a big uh, thing, but it'll be funny. La- Joel's going to be walking up to Ellie in The Last of Us 2, and you have to breathe slowly on the back of her neck. <laughs> yeah. Something <laughs> There's going to be some goofy examples that are, people are going to be like, why did why did this developer even bother? Yeah. God. Before we get to the big question, I wanted to – so Ryan McCaffrey tweeted this out, and he said, I know my following tilts towards Xbox, obviously, but humor me anyway here just as a fun exercise if you don't mind. For those who don't know, Ryan McCaffrey, host of Podcast Unlocked, huge Xbox guy, had a chance to interview Phil Spencer recently, yada, yada, yada. So we tweeted a poll where you selected offset thumbsticks or inline thumbsticks. Me personally, as an Xbox guy, I obviously prefer offset. Tanner talked about how he prefers inline. His poll, 66% offset, 33% inline. Makes sense. It's an Xbox guy, right? Mm -hmm. The interesting thing to me is that Greg Miller tweeted this out as well because Ryan McCaffrey posted to his own tweet and said, 
if Greg Miller tweeted this, it would be the exact same thing, but opposite, right? Mm -hmm. Which wasn't mm -hmm. the case, actually. So Greg Miller tweeted this out, and he got back 52% offset, 47% in line. Which is pretty interesting to me, because obviously Greg Miller, huge PlayStation guy, followed by a lot of PlayStation people. And to Tanner's point, he works with a lot of people that prefer the offset sticks. Yeah. It's very interesting to me, because in my mind, I always thought it was a 50-50 thing of preference, right? Because that's what you'd assume. But it seems like more people like offset than I thought, which is strange. I just thought that was weird. Uh, for reference... More people are wrong! <laughs> <laughs> Greg Miller's tweet had uh, 25,000 responses, and Ryan McCaffrey's had 20,000 as well. So you're looking at 45,000 people, roughly. Obviously, some overlap there, but pretty interesting polls. I, I just thought it was in terms of your assumptions of what people prefer, kind of went against that. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to see these, Dom. I think, I, I Tanner, did. you got a chance to look at these. I put some mock-ups of some oh. uh, DualSense controllers in the doc that we share for the podcast. And this, I guess we'll get into this real quick before we look at the mock-ups. One of my biggest gripes with the controller is the color design. I think it's hideous, I, the, the two-tone. And it's not even really two-tone because if you actually look at the controller, it's like there's white, there's black triggers, there's black thumbsticks, and then the black on the bottom reads more like a really rich, dark navy and less like black. I, oh, that yeah. might just be... Yeah, like... I thought it's it was like more, blue. I thought it was blue, too, but people are saying it's black. I read it as oh. navy blue. Yeah, it's but, navy yeah, to me. Yeah, it's just all over the place, right? And I hate that. I think it's ugly. Form factor shape, I like because I prefer Xbox. Obviously, Tanner said he, if he wants an Xbox controller, he'll get an Xbox controller. I'm, are all of us in agreement that the... You already said, Tanner, I guess the two-tone doesn't work. It. Do you think this is a weird decision? Because I don't think it works. Uh, I, I think, personally, this is just me, I think it makes the controller look like it's wearing a suit of armor. <laughs> like it, it looks like a Avengers shell. armor. <laughs> yeah, it looks like a shell has been encased around a controller. Like maybe it would work well if those curves near the touchpad and near the bottom of the controller weren't throwing me off because it literally looks like a shell over top of it. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, so maybe if if those were more seamline, um, maybe maybe it would work better for me. Um, but I, I, it just, it makes it look like it's wearing a shell and I just, I can't get behind it. I want to talk about how the controller looks in reference to the console, but first I want to talk about these mock-ups I found. So if you guys had a chance to look at them or not, somebody made a yeah. mock-up of an all black one with gold accents for a Kingdom Hearts inspired controller. Oh, I saw that. So that the, looks awesome. <laughs> yeah. The light bar is gold, which doesn't really make sense. I don't think the light bar would ever really be gold, but no. the, the, instead of the PlayStation logo, it has obviously a Kingdom Hearts symbol. I like that it's all black. That kind of makes the controller read a lot better to me, personally, as one unified color. And as I went through the mock-ups, I think that's the thing I liked the most, is it being all one color. The 20th uh, anniversary design, I love. Obviously, people who are like, ah, I'm tired of nostalgia plays, but the PlayStation logo being colored in and having the OG colors for the sacred symbol buttons, I just think it works really well. So when I was the reason I wanted to bring these up is there's also an all-black regular one as, uh, as well. I think my biggest problem is that it's two-tone and it just doesn't work well. The moment we see one that's all one unified color with some accents to it, I think I'll like the controller a lot more. I don't know how, yeah. if you guys feel the same way. I do, I do personally, yeah. I, I mean, I, I for me, the biggest problems with the controller are the fact that it looks like a shell and the fact that it's two-tone. So if you get something in there that is one color or generally speaking one color, you know, if it, if it's all black or something like that, or all red or something like that, you know, I have my red DualShock Four, so I'm gonna be hopefully getting a red one if there is one. Um, but if the, if there's if there's one that's all one color, I feel like that would look visually a lot better on the eyes than something like this, because that black just looks completely out of place to me. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I definitely did a double take the first time because uh, Jared, Jared sent us a screenshot and uh, and I was like, wait, is that real? I was oh, like, yeah, I was like, uh, th that was wild. a choice, I believe is what I said. Yeah, because I was just like, I definitely did a double take. Like, that's so crazy. But, like, it grew on me really fast. Like, it's definitely weird. You can't – I don't think you can deny that. It's definitely – especially as a default controller design, right? It's definitely a bit – uh, more out there with the with the two colors yeah. but but i definitely am digging it um 
And I think for what we saw like late PS4 is uh, we've been seeing Sony release a lot of different color variations of the DualShock 4. Mm. Some are weird. You know, there's like Fruity Loop looking DualShock 4s <laughs> and all sorts of random color combinations that they're putting out. Um, and it, it kind of feels like that's what inspired this a little bit to go with the two colors. Um, but this default one of the white and what I'm gonna still say is navy. I don't, I didn't, people calling it black, whatever. The sticks are black, but yeah, the, the, the bottom of the controller is definitely navy, like, whatever. But I'm into it. Um, it looks very, um, looks very Detroit Become Human, um, which I think is pretty cool. <laughs> it, but it looks like a controller you'd find when you're watching Drake and Josh, like, you know, the game yeah. sphere, like, uh, oh, the game sphere. Man. Yeah. Uh, here's a way to correct this, Sony. How about you finally release a PlayStation Design Lab where people can, like, design their own DualSense controller? Oh, it still yes. irritates me that PlayStation gamers don't have that when Xbox does. Like, Xbox Design Lab is so dope, man. And it's one of those, obviously, fanboys talk about, like, ah, it's something we have and you don't. It's like, what, what a dumb... <laughs> You're an asshole. Get away. You know, it's <laughs> like, I want PlayStation gamers who want to have their own personalized yeah. DualShock or DualSense now. Like, I don't know. It sucks. I would, I I would love to... Yeah, like I'm a, I'm a PlayStation fan. I play PlayStation games exclusively. I don't own an Xbox. I would love to be able to customize my own controller. Like that that is something that Xbox has over PlayStation where it's not even like a thing. It's like that's a fact. Like they just have that over PlayStation. <laughs> yeah. You can't argue about it. You can argue whether or not it's important to you, but they do have that over PlayStation and yeah. and having that customization means a lot to some people and that does mean a lot to me i mean i've you know when i had my ps3 i i, I dreamt of the days that i could order a custom controller or whatever and obviously you could do that for hundreds of dollars but nobody wants to put down that kind of scratch in order for it yeah um so the fact that xbox players have that ability to customize their controller that's that's a great thing and i hope playstation does that with this especially considering you know the one thing the shell design i'm just going to call it the shell design the one thing the shell design has is that as an advantage you can kind of customize each side and each shell any color that you want to if they're like different parts so like you could have the left side of the controller be black you could have the right side be green the middle be indigo i i don't know i'm throwing together together combinations but you know what i mean like it seems like they're all separate parts so there's really a market for that if you if you want to go in there and, and customize it completely. Well, and yeah, then the I'll be curious to see if they Sorry, if they now. do that. I'll be curious to see if they do that because this yeah. it being like two tone by default opens up a lot of possibilities for customization. And different. And the thing that sucks too is that. for people who don't really like the Dual Sense, you can't really use your Dual Shock Four because then like Xbox, they're not like your accessories aren't coming over too, right? So. Yeah, did they say that or not? I, I I'm it's, assuming. It's, it hasn't been confirmed or deconfirmed, right? I'm just yeah. assuming. It, it, there, are, there are rumors out there right now of it. Um, the PlayStation is not officially said whether you can or not. Um, personally, I put out on Twitter. I put this out on Twitter. But personally, I'm going to wait to see how the DualSense feels in my hands. But yeah. if I have the option of using my DualShock 4 on the PS5, I honestly might do it. Because I, I really can't get around this design. Well, the, the thing is, like, the biggest differences are the built-in mic, which won't be game-changing, right, in terms of mm -hmm. using an older a DualShock 4, and right. the haptic triggers and stuff, which, like, improves your gameplay experience, but isn't, like, changing things. Like, the, the DualSense has the touchpad, and it has the light bar. So it has, like, the main implementation, so I don't... It's gonna be... It's one of those things that, like, Sony, just let us know. That's like, it's... Not that imp I mean, it's important, but it's not like a huge thing that people are waiting for, right? Just like it's right. one of those things. Like, just give us that information already. Because um, yeah, then you'd probably see uh, a spike in like DualShock Four sales for the next couple months here before PS Five. Because like, I, I mean, I'd buy another one in one of the cooler colors, you know, knowing that yeah. it's going to work going forward. Because right now it's like you wouldn't if you didn't need it absolutely, you wouldn't buy a new one right now of a DualShock Four. Well, yeah. and you're not sure if it's going to work. To Tanner's point, I would say that this is probably the most divisive launch controller we've seen in a while. Mm -hmm. Like, I think most yeah. of the time these controllers come out and it's like, oh, yeah, cool, awesome. And there's, like, yeah. very few people that are like, hell no. This is, like, one of the first times I've seen a controller be revealed and it's, like, it's still mostly positive, but I do, there's a lot of people who are like, nah, not for me. <laughs> nah, dog, that's a no for me. Um, mm -hmm. The last thing I want to talk about is... What the DualSense's design means for the design of the PlayStation 5. 
So we talked about this before the show that normally the you know the release console and the controller that comes with it are a design pair. They're meant to work aesthetically together. Uh, most of the time, you get a black console, you get a black controller, you get a white console, you get a white controller. This being dual tone has people kind of like excited and also worried <laughs> about what the PlayStation Five is going to look like. The only idea we have is the dev kit, which it'll likely look nothing like, which is like the V-shaped weird thing. The old pizza slot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, what do you guys think the chances are this is as dual tone as the controller, or do you think it'll be mostly one color, which I assume white, with elements of black, right? Or do you think it will be more dual tone where you see a, a closer to 50-50 split? Dude, this thing's going to be dual tone for sure. Like maybe like 60 yeah. 40 or whatever, right on line with the controller. I can't imagine it being different than the controller. Right? Like maybe the top, you know, section of it, the, the, you see the most of will be white and then like the base will be black or something like that. But, yeah. and I also think it's going to be equally divisive uh, because that's a just, <laughs> that's a divisive ass statement right there. That Is it, you know, outside of color, do you think it's going to be traditional shape? It'll probably be, I think, traditional shape, but it'll be like, Quote yeah, unquote, the colors yeah. that are gonna, that are gonna be split people. Um, but I don't know. I, I, I have faith in, in their design. I guess uh, we'll see. But I think it's gonna get a lot of people like ew kind of thing. <laughs> like, similarly, but I think it also will grow too, kind of like, because that was my uh, initial reaction to the Series X too. Was like, bro, that's a, that's a rectangle, like an upward rectangle. That's a PC. An like, obelisk. <laughs> yeah, I was like what the hell like why would that's a great looking pc but not a that's not even gonna fit in my entertain what the heck how are you gonna but i'm starting like it's definitely come around a lot and i'm starting to appreciate the, the look of the series x more um it's still odd and different um but i think that's okay and I, I can appreciate them trying to do new things and and that kind of thing but i think the ps5 is gonna i think it's gonna have a similar reaction that this controller had Nothing can be worse than the VCR Xbox One. I think it was hideous. Fair. Uh, <laughs> yeah, even as an Xbox guy, I think it's gross. Um, and then we got the S and the X, which I think are well-designed consoles. I even like the Series X. Mm. Uh, Tanner, so you are you really don't like the controller. Yeah. Does that worry you with the console then? Because you, you really don't like the aesthetic of the controller that you think the console is going to not be something you want to look at? So, so I was having this conversation with my buddy the other night. And, you know... While the look and design of the controller is very important to me, I frankly couldn't give a rat's ass what the design of the console is because it's a box. Yeah, it looks it, it, it'd be nice if it looked nice on my shelf or desk or wherever I put it. Um, but it I'm not looking at the console. I'm gonna be looking at the screen and looking at my controller from time to time. And visuals of the controller matter because the visuals of the, con of the controller generally dictate how the controller feels, which is why I'm worried about the dual sense because it looks like trash. Well, you're seeing means, it way more. You're holding yeah, that controller. <laughs> yeah. Which Boxes means, yeah. right, which means it might feel like trash. Now, there are exceptions to that rule. Personally, I think the Nintendo Switch Pro Controller looks like donkey shit, but it feels great. I agree. It, it, <laughs> I, I feel the controller. Like, I, I have one in my hand right now. This feels great. I don't think it's the best thing designed in the world, but it definitely feels good in the hand. I think that's the one exception of a controller that looks terrible but feels amazing. But generally speaking, controllers ha the controllers look amazing and they feel amazing, or they look terrible and they feel terrible. With a console, it matters more about what's inside rather than outside. Um, yeah. So, from so you're not an me, inter not entertainment system guy, right? Or it's like, oh, it's not going to match all of my other stuff. Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, on my desk right now, I have a statue of Nathan Drake, my PS4, <laughs> and my Switch. Like that's yeah. all I've got on here. Um, I think it it matters a lot for like marketing, right? Because the picture yeah. of the box is what's on ads and stuff, and how that's presented is where that's where it matters more. Because wait, when it's right. in your entertainment center, it's like it blends in for the most part, and it's there, and it's sweet. Right. Yeah. 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 No. Uh, for, now, from an advertising standpoint, I think that's a completely different story. Right. Um. But but for me personally, I I couldn't care less what it looks like. Well, I don't want to say I couldn't care less. I probably could care less. <laughs> I, I I could. I don't want the design to look like, you know, a pile of crap. Like I don't want it to look like, you know, 
pieces of scrap metal thrown together. But generally speaking, if it's got a decent shape, I won't mind it. Yeah, it's it's weird because like <laughs> what Sony did with the PS4 Pro, where they just added another burger patty. Like, I wonder. <laughs> yeah. I wonder what the second version of the PlayStation. We don't even know what the first version's gonna look like, but. No. You know, normally we see like a black console, and then its uh, reiteration is like the opposite color, white, right, or the other way around. With the PlayStation, if it's going to be black and white dual tone, what is the revision? Is it like the opposite of that, or is it all one color? It's going to be really interesting to see how that plays. And then with uh, like custom console designs for game releases, that's what has me intrigued about the Xbox Series X is because they're kind of like giant billboards and. There's a lot of real estate where you could do some really cool stuff. You could also do some really hideous stuff uh, <laughs> with it. So I'm very curious Man, to see how that plays out. Talk about cool mock-ups. I've seen a lot of cool Series X custom consoles that people photoshopped. and Some cyberpunk yeah. ones are dope. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah it's yeah. so good. Like, there was a Gears of War one that was just like, holy shit, that's sweet. Yeah. Now, now don't get me wrong. I'm not the biggest fan of the, of the Series X design. Um, but... Again, I, I still stand by that design is not something that's incredibly important. The Series X, though, is, is, is an interesting point because that's going vertical. Like, that's the skyscraper unit. That is the one exception where it might be hard to fit in an entertainment center or something like that. Now, you can set it on the side or – I actually, I'm not sure if you can you set can. it on the side. I you can. You can set it on your yeah. side. Yeah. Um, it's still quite tall, though, so I don't – Yeah. Side, I don't, yeah. So, you know, I think that's one exception where the design does actually matter because that matters of how you're going to arrange your your desk or your entertainment center or whatever. But even even still, even in that wonky design scenario, I still don't think it matters that much. Like if you have the space for it, there you go. That's well, it. Like with the the PlayStation, all they need to do is sell the reason why it looks like it looks. With Xbox, yeah. the reason it looks like that is it's the form fits the function. That's what they explained. Like, the reason right. it had to be that way so it could properly cool so it doesn't sound like a jet engine. And to that point, from what I've heard from people who own PS4 Pros, I think more PlayStation owners would be happy if they announced that the PS5 was quieter than the PS4 than if it looked similar to it, right? Dude. Like, people would be more okay with a, a design they're not super cool with if... The, the console was quieter, right, at peak. And it is so intermittent and random when that happens because, like, most of the time, my pro, my PS4 Pro is, is fine. Fans kick on, but it's not loud, right? But then every so often, it's like, you'd be in a pause menu or, like, and they kick on full speed, and I'm like, <laughs> why are the fans cranking up now? It, 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 it's weird. I, I don't know if it's something, if there's some other things at play, uh, but it seemed yeah. like, and I didn't understand any much of what Mark Cerny was saying, but he spent a lot of time talking about cooling and how that all worked for the PS5, so hopefully they fix that shit. Well, that's the yeah. thing is, what if they do a form meets function too and theirs looks unorthodox, right? That yeah, can totally yeah. be the case. might not be an obelisk mm -hmm. like the Xbox Series X, but if that is an issue that they heard about, and we've heard about it quite a bit of people being like, yo, my PS4 is loud, that should prioritize everything, right? In my opinion, mm -hmm. of like, you want to make it the, the best product people can own, so... That's that for DualSense and the PS5. Let's talk about what we've been playing. I don't have too much to say. So, been playing some more COD Warzone with friends. Uh, nothing really to report there. Um, pretty much just people using thermal sites. You know, it is what it is. <laughs> uh, playing a ton of Animal Crossing. Ton of Animal Crossing. God, so much Animal Crossing. Uh, one of my villagers bought one of my t-shirt designs and was wearing it, which is dope. Uh, I, I have a dish shirt I designed, Tanner, of the N7 logo from Mass Effect. I'm a huge Mass mm. Effect guy. And, like, one Gosh of my it. villagers bought the shirt, so I was like, hell yeah, he's a Mass Effect fan. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, just having a blast with that game, taking it at its own pace. Um, not time traveling or anything. I know I'm, you know, I used to play the hell out of Animal Crossing on GameCube, so I know how to get the most out of the game without kind of either overindulging or manipulating the game and losing the fun in it. So, mm. and, uh... Lastly, this is something I tweeted about. A friend and I randomly decided to replay through Halo Reach for the first time since its release back in 2010. Uh, my best friend since childhood, we decided to play through it. Game holds up pretty well. Uh, Halo Reach has been my favorite campaign of the Halo games. It was right there with uh, 2 and 3 for me. Like, Depending on the day you'd catch me on, it's whatever one I'd find my favorite. But replaying through that story, it holds up really well. I know 
Halo hardcore fans had issues with the abilities that were implemented in that game and how they affected Halo moving forward, but I enjoyed it. Uh, if you're familiar with the characters in that game, George is my boy. He's the big, like, massive tank dude who, uh, spoilers, uh, gives his life for the greater unit. Um, I like that game for the same reason I like Rogue One. Rogue One's my favorite Star Wars movie, <clears throat> so you can see kind of draw a correlation there of uh, Halo Reach being my favorite wow. campaign. I love Suicide so just- Missions. Yeah, you just love inevitable death, well, huh? Well, my you know you know my favorite video game of all time, Mass Effect Two. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm just I love the suicide mission, inevitable death. But yeah, it held up really well. We we're planning on playing through the rest of the games at a at a decent rate, not all at once. One thing I will say is, and maybe Tanner, you can answer this. I wonder if PlayStation has an equivalent to Halo Master Chief Collection in terms of sheer amount of trophies. So the Halo Master Chief Collection has. 700 achievements. What? 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 How? There's seven games. Each game has 100 achievements. Yeah. Each game has... What? There's... So there's... There's the five main lines, right? Five main line games. ODST. Oh, five is included? Shit. Yeah. No, no, no. Five isn't included. It's the four main line games, ODST, Anniversary, and Halo 2 Remake. Wait, I'm missing gosh. one, I think. Oh, so there's like the original one and two, but then also the remakes of one and two? Yeah, separate achievement lists. But separate achievement lists. Okay. Oh, damn. What? Yeah. Damn. yeah. I don't, there's not an equivalent on PlayStation to that, right? The closest oh, one I would assume would be the no. Nathan Drake collection? <laughs> no, I mean, not even. I mean, I, I, not even close. I mean. That's like 50 trophies a pop for each of those games, so yeah, or something Maybe, like that. I, I think the original PS3 games were about 50, and there's less in the remaster because there's no multiplayer there. Mm-hmm. So, okay. yeah, that I, I mean, I can I have my PlayStation up next to me. I could check. I'm not going to. Cause you don't have to I worry about it. Know how, <laughs> I don't know how far down I'd have to go for the Nathan Drake collection, but, I mean, that would probably be the closest but i would say that's not even close because i don't think oh, yeah <laughs> i don't think anything comes close to 700 that's yeah, because ridiculous what that yeah. really points out i mean we're talking we're focused on achievements and trophies but what that points out in a larger sense is there's nothing on playstation there's no collection of games as large as the master chief collection probably ever in the history of games actually well, not just if, yeah. versus well, ps4 well, that's a crazy thing is like halo's been running for so long you look at playstation they have tremendous exclusives but I, what, what Ratchet and Clank would be their franchise with the most entries? I would assume. Yeah, yeah, it'd probably be about. It probably, yeah, yeah, probably Ratchet and Clank. Yeah, and you can. I mean, there's positives and negatives to that, right? Where like that that means well, finally we're we're done with Killzone and we finally get a Horizon Zero Dawn, right? And so on. <laughs> that can there can be good things with that, but well, but it's, then, so- it, it's cool for Halo though that they have this collection. Well, like yeah. for Uncharted right now, it already has five, right? Well, five, and then yeah. if they were to ever include the PSP game, right, or P- Vita game, I mean, Golden mm-hmm. Abyss. Well, v- well, Vita has Vita has a, tr- a trophy list, or or Golden Abyss has a trophy list. But I mean, so, all in one collection, right? Because that's not in the oh, Nathan Drake collection. No, well, yeah. the Nathan Drake collection is just one, two, three. Mm-hmm. It's not even four. It's not Lost Legacy. It's just one, two, three. So, um, yeah. So yeah, an that, Uncharted collection, right, would be the closest because it'd be if you, five if you games were, if you were, and a side game. Well, I mean, I, I mean, Ratchet and Clank would probably be closer because I mean that was a series that started on PS2, had multiple entries on PS3. Well, it only had one on PS4. I think Ratchet and Clank would be more, but not by much. I mean, God of War right. is pretty okay. up God there, right? God of yeah. War has what six? As the three four, games, the one, reboot, two, Ghost of Sparta. The PSP yeah, game, and then if you want to count the game. cell phone game, the, the, <laughs> oh, Kingdom Hearts that, too. Sure. Kingdom Hearts has a number of games as well. Oh well, uh, I mean, if you want to yeah. count if you want to count the seventy-two entries in that franchise that are somehow uh, all important. <laughs> that was a whole diatribe. Sorry about that. Kind of went off on a tangent. <laughs> Anyways, as an achievement hunter myself, it's cool to see them. A lot of them are like beat this game on X difficulty and beat the par score, which is like beat it at a certain like time, you know, and they have all the multiplayer mm-hmm. achievements and yada, yada, yada. Um, but there's a lot of meat on that bone there. Yeah. 700 achievements, 7,000 gamer score quite a bit. Uh, what I will say, Halo Master Chief Collection actually runs now and is functioning, which is great. That's a weird thing about that game is like 
if you were there at the launch of that title, it was a complete mess. And it's like, on one hand, you're like, well, this is such an impressive thing they're doing. It hasn't really been done. I get why there's so many problems. But then again, this is supposed to be your premier collection of your premier franchise. Like, what's the deal there? They finally, over the years, have fixed it, thankfully. So glad to Dude, see it run smoothly. The fact I, I played through uh, some of those in the Chief Collection, but like, I, I didn't spend too much time in the multiplayer, but the multiplayer is incredible. Because the way that they, it, it's all like one interface, right? But it's modes from every single game and the maps yeah. from every single game and you could just like quickly switch between like halo 2 and 3 maps and playlists and like that's bonkers and so i get like you were saying why that was was tough for them to get to this point but now for sure it's like that's crazy impressive how they uh, uh you know anthologized or whatever all that multi that's stuff a cool especially. thing too is people don't talk about is they have custom playlists for a campaign that are like missions from different games that are like an arc like a certain oh, nice. arc okay yeah, which is a really cool idea, too. So it's like puts together all these missions and it tells a story over an arc, right? Instead of having to play through all the games. Really cool stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I can't wait to see what that looks like on the Series X because, you know, that thing's going to be implemented and optimized to hell on that thing. So we'll see. Anyways, that's it for me. I wanted uh, one thing I wanted to mention. I wanted to get to Doom Eternal, but I got in that weird place. I'm assuming you guys have done this in the past as well. Of, by the time I was getting ready to start it, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to finish this in time for Final Fantasy VII Remake, which I pre-ordered, which is coming out, obviously, on the 10th. So instead of starting Doom Eternal, I was just like, I'm just going to like play other stuff and then play Final Fantasy Remake and then play Doom Eternal and get to it afterwards. I just didn't want to start it and then jump from it, you know? Um, so, yeah, I found myself in that weird place this week. Mm. Pretty much it for Man. me. Uh, so I finished Control. Hell yeah. It's a dope game. Oh, yeah, we game. talked really... about the ashtray maze. Oh, man, the ashtray Sequence maze. is so dope. You were, you were right about that. I did not... You said it was cool, and, and I pictured one thing. I pictured, like, a crazy hallucinogenic-type, trippy, like, Dishonored-style level, and it was not that. I mean, it, it made you think it was going to be at first, but then when you come back with the, the headphones, it, it turns into, like, oh, okay, I see what they're doing here. This is awesome. I won't, like, go, go on them and spoil it and everything. It's, you were right, though. It's fantastic. The funny thing is, people complained about Quantum Break's ending, a Red Remedy's last game, and I actually liked the ending to that game. I didn't like the ending to Control, where you're scaling the towers up. Um, I don't think it was like checkpointed perfectly, and it just is. It's a video game thing of like the last. They has to have a last boss, and sometimes it just doesn't really make sense with the rest of the game. Um, and there was a huge difficulty spike, as opposed to the rest of the game. Like once you get to that final area. It just, like, ramps up crazy. And it's like, oh, you want me to use cover for, like, the first time in this game. Um, yeah, so, still a beautiful I game. I didn't get that. <laughs> yeah. I well, Tanner, uh, 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 Tanner, uh, I already forgot our old co-host's name. Dumb. Uh, Jordan. Jordan. I couldn't pull Jordan's <laughs> name. We used to have a third co-host. He recently uh, left the podcast, Tanner, episode 180. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. He, me and him were on the same boat at that of, like, the ending just kind of fell apart. Uh, but that game's so incredible that it holds up outside of that. And that's why I was surprised when you were like, yeah, I like the ending. And I was like, oh. <laughs> so. Yeah, it, it did that thing. Um, spoilers for God of War. Um, there wasn't really a final boss where it kind of felt like there was going to be. And it made it worked in God of War. But here it kind of felt like a, a lead up to like this f confrontation where like, uh, you know, there was going to be a big boss and, it, and there just wasn't. And it's fine. I was always like, okay, sure. But it kind of, I, I kind of felt like I was waiting for it and it just didn't happen. But narratively, I, I liked the ending and, and the stuff that happened after and all that. But overall, a great game. Control. Hell yeah. Agree. Anything well, else? Yeah. I yeah, played a lot of Resident Evil 3, which is also a great game. Uh, still not actually done with it. Probably this weekend we're going to finish it up. But having a lot of fun with, with that. I think 2 is better. The remake for RE2. Uh, it's a safe. That's better. a safe opinion to have on the internet. Yeah, I, yeah, I know. crazy hot take, right? But uh, without spoiling, uh, where are you at in the game? I have a reference for like the game, so uh, it's been like six days. Did the whole spider thing? That was kind of a pain. Um, did the whole Carlos thing, and just got done fighting like the the mutated version of Nemesis. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so somewhere after that, yeah. Swamp Nemesis. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, Tanner, what have you been playing? Uh, so I've been playing a lot of uh, Call of Duty Warzone uh, and Modern Warfare just because I own that copy, so I get both of them. 
Uh, so I've been playing that. And then I also recently just finished up uh, my playthrough of Modern Warfare 2 Campaign Remastered. Ooh, nice. Uh, uh, I was reviewing that for Dual Shockers. Um, so I, I just finished that up. That is... That is such a mixed bag of a game. <laughs> um, I mean, on, on one hand... It, it's a beautiful remaster. Like, it looks gorgeous, especially when you compare it to the original 2009 game. But you can really feel the lack of multiplayer in that. I mean, it, it, mm. I, I mean the campaign is, is relatively short, six to seven hours or so. Um, and, like, when you're done with it, you're you're done with it. You know, in the original game, you could go play multiplayer. You got Spec Ops. You got, you know, a whole bunch of of stuff that you a whole money a whole bunch of more hours that you could put into the game. Um with this it's just like, oh, okay, your experience is done. That's it. And Dude, and it, yeah. Does it feel like they're like light on marketing for this? So I would say that's intentional. Yeah. Yeah, I, I this is a weird game. <laughs> um I mean the rumor was that it was it's been done for 2 years. You know the 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 rumor that I think Charlie Intel was 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 throwing out there was that this game has been completed development wise since 2018. That's I don't know wild. how true that is, but if that's the case, I, I mean I could I could totally see it happening because it's on the same engine as Modern Warfare One Remastered, and that came out in 2016. Um, there's the same weapon in specs for, for like so for like weapons that carried over from Modern Warfare One to this one obviously the designs are slightly tweaked but it's the same exact weapon animations um in terms of in terms of sound in terms of in specs like the, it's the exact same which begs the question of why was this just not an add-on for modern warfare one remastered why not just make a master chief collection style thing and put them all into one game I think it's because uh, it got blowback for the first one, right? Where you had to buy the special edition to get access. Well, to yeah, Marvel they well, they had that that yeah. great idea where you had to buy the eighty dollar <laughs> version of Infinite War or whatever. Yeah. To your point, I would have talked about me playing this this week too, but unfortunately, <laughs> as month exclusivity and like I understand because yeah. they've had a partnership, but in the current situation, as like a publisher, you kind of had to read the room, and they should have understood yeah. that like this is gonna blow over way worse than in a normal circumstance because people are at home yeah. and like there's so many people who love that campaign obviously they love the multiplayer as yeah. well but like it being ex like and this is a game that was way more tied to xbox at the time right the original yeah. than playstation so the remake yeah. of it being being <laughs> exclusive yeah. to playstation is like I, hurts even more there was uh well, well, the again. So, if you go under the assumption that the game's been done since twenty eighteen, back then, Sony had a different exclusivity deal with with uh, Activision, where they did get things thirty days early. Yeah. So, if you're going under that exclusivity deal, if that exclusivity deal was made for Modern Warfare Two Campaign Remastered back then, and it's just now coming out. That makes sense, and I and I'm not defending it. I'm just explaining like exactly that. Makes, yeah. That that just lends credence to the fact that yeah, maybe this was done since 2018, which is that that just blows my mind that they've just been sitting on this. Because I remember Modern Warfare 2 is one of my favorite first person shooters. Like many people, it's one of my favorite first person shooters ever. Um, and you know I have so many good memories of that with my buddy. And when that when the first original Amazon Italy listing came out years ago I, I I called up my buddy or I didn't call up my buddy I was with his I was with him at the time and I told him and I and, and we were getting so hyped over it and then crickets for months and months and months until a year later when another listing came out and I reported on that and I wrote about it and then nothing for months and months and months and it's just like how how has this? I, I thought years ago it was it was bullshit because we never got anything, but they've been sitting on it for two years. How, that's crazy. Yeah. Well, the thing that sucks for like so me and Dom are big COD Four guys. Like we're yeah. COD Four veterans. Like that's one of our favorite games. And yeah. when the remaster for that was announced, and then it's like no, you have to pay an eighty dollars pay eighty dollars for a game you don't want to get the game you do want. That sucked. Yeah. I never got around to it. That's one of my favorite games of all time, and I still haven't gotten around to playing it, which sucks. Then well, this thing wasn't. 
uh, re- really quickly, they did release it separately later on. Yeah, I'm kind of being um, spiteful and like a little petty. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then if you, I don't know if you guys own PlayStations, but it was actually free for PlayStation Plus members. Yeah, for I a have while. it as a result yeah. of that. Um, yeah. Going back to the achievement junkie in me, like if I'm going to play it again, I want to be able to perfect it and get the thousand gamer score, you know. Uh, and I'm being spiteful and a little petty there, I'll, I'll admit. But and then with <laughs> oh, this, I understand it. <laughs> this was announced, and I'm like, "Yo, dude, if this is any, as if this is thirty dollars or less, I'm buying it immediately and playing it." Yeah. And then they announce it for twenty bucks. I'm like, "Hell yeah!" And they're like, "Yeah, it's exclusive to PlayStation for a month." I'm like, "Ah, oh, god damn it!" So like a month yeah. from now, I don't know if I'm going to get around to buying it. I eventually will, but it's like. Now it's like, uh, when you already had me for that immediate, like, reactionary buy, you know what I mean? And I'm like, ugh. Yeah. Yeah. And then I, a month I, from I, now, I, sorry to interrupt you, for a month from now, yeah. we don't know how the economy is going to look. We don't know how people are going to be yeah. with their expendable income. Like, that 30 days can make a huge difference in terms of how well that sells. It's still Call of Duty. Yeah. It'll sell great on, on Xbox, duh. But, like, yeah. they're, it's going to hurt because of that, I think, given the cur- cer- uh, yeah. current circumstances. I, I mean, I, I looked at the... Again, I, I was able I was fortunate enough to get a code from Activision. They sent a code over. I just for clarity's sake. Um, but when that was still in limbo, like you know, we I, I'm not going to go into details on our communications with them, but um, you know, there was a point where I I was I, I was like, is twenty dollars a good price to buy it, or or what or what's a good price to buy it at, um, and. I was I said to myself I'm like if it's just campaign thirty dollars is a fair price I'll, I'll throw down thirty dollars for it um and then it came out as twenty and I was like wow that's that's a surprisingly cheap deal from Activision I mean Activision is kind of known for being greedy um you won't but, say <laughs> yeah well I, I mean Activision is kind of known for 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 squeezing as much money as they can out of people. So for $20, I was like, hell yeah, that's, that's a great price. Even for just campaign. I mean, $20 that, that's, that's, that's still good. And I still defend that price. Even with the game severely lacking replayability, I still stand by that that $20 is a really great price for this. Um, but man, I mean, it, it's so apparent how, like I mean, I, one of the one of the leakers who leaked Modern Warfare Two Remastered or has been consistently over the past couple of years, he is still insisting on Twitter that multiplayer is coming, and I don't know whether or not I believe him. Mostly because I don't know how that would be implemented into a twenty dollar game if they would charge you twenty more dollars for the multiplayer, or if it would just be a free update. Come on, it probably wouldn't be a free update, but. Uh, you know, if it gets multiplayer later on, that's a great deal. You know, a lot of people love the multiplayer for Modern Warfare 2. But as the way that it stands, man, it's just, it's it's severely lacking replayability. I, but I still love it. The game looks beautiful. It controls beautiful. It, the story's still as great as it was back in 2009. But, man. In terms of multiplayer, I think best case scenario, you get Season 4 drops of, like, things related to MW2. I don't see it having its own multiplayer thing. It's who knows, I didn't though. see it having its own multiplayer either. But I, I, and again, I I sort of called the dude out on it on Twitter. I was just like, really? You think they're gonna add multiplayer to a game that's called Campaign Remastered? Like, I don't <laughs> see that. I don't see that happening at all. But he was he was sticking to it. He's like, I have talked to people that have played it, and so I'm like. My dad okay. works at Activision. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the dude's been the dude has a consistent track record. He he leaked the Warzone Battle Royale map a year before it was even announced. So the guy has has some sort of inside information. Yeah, who's to say if plans have changed since when he heard that? Like, who knows? Well, he uh, said he says he talks to them. He talked to them a few days ago, okay. and they they're still saying it. So again, I don't know, but. Uh, before we close out, anything else you wanted to mention that you've been playing? Um, let's see. I've been doing Call of Duty Warzone, doing Modern Warfare Two. I I know both Call of Duty games. Um, played a little bit of Uncharted Four multiplayer recently. Mm, nice, nice. Um, been playing, been playing the Yu Gi Oh Switch game. <laughs> but oh, nice. 
I uh, I know a lot of people aren't into Yu Gi Oh, so I won't get too nerdy into that. But that's that's a really fun uh, little card game that they have. Hold up my monocle. I'm more of a Magic the Gathering man myself. <laughs> oh God, I I have a terrible experience with Magic the Gathering. I went to a card shop. This is a really short story. I promise. I went to a card shop near my apartment, and uh, we walked inside, and. Uh, they they were primarily magic. They they had a lot of tables set up with people playing Magic the Gathering and I went to them and I asked them if they had any Yu-Gi-Oh cards and they looked at me as if I had a third eye. Like they they were just like, "Ugh, Yu-Gi-Oh? No, we don't sell those here." And that's it's just a, like That's why I said Monaco, the Magic the Gathering yeah. community as a whole kind of looks yeah. down on Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah. Uh, I don't. And, and, but, then, you know. and then and then and then ironically enough, the store went out of business like a month later, but <laughs> Yeah, I had I had the opposite thing where I was at my local game shop, and before the Friday Night Magic tournament was starting, two kids playing Yu-Gi-Oh got into a fist fight in front Whoa. of me, flipped over a table, and started fighting. Yeah, <clears throat> oh I grew up playing gosh. Yu-Gi-Oh. But I just like you know, it's they're both cool. I don't I don't really mind either. Yeah. Uh, anyways, no, I don't either. Before we close out, Tanner, please let people know where they can find you on the internet. Uh, well, you can find my articles at DualShockers.com, otherwise known as DualSensors.com. That's a joke. It's not actually... Actually, I think if you go to DualSensors.com now, it redirects to our site. Yeah. Does it? Yeah. Yes! (laughs) Oh, shit. Oh, yeah, I just did it. It redirects. So, yeah, you can go to DualSensors if you want to, DualSensors.com. Uh, but no, I, I, I work for DualShockers.com, so you can check out my articles, reviews there. You can check out my Modern Warfare 2 campaign remastered review, which is not out yet, but it's in the process of being written. So that will be coming in the next few days. Um, but in terms of social media, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Tman2096. Nerdy name, I know, but I've been sticking to that since I was in high school, and I don't plan on changing it anytime soon. Um, and that's really the only social media that I'm on. Um, so yeah, that's where you can find me. Cool. Uh, I want to have you on again. You're a great guest. Thanks for coming on. We appreciate it. Sure. No problem. Love talking video games, especially in this time where we're trapped inside our houses with nothing else to do. So it works. <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for so the... much for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, no problem. Uh, dual shockers, you know, good staff. So I figured pluck some people from there, get them on. <laughs> good call. Uh, if you guys can, please follow us on YouTube. Search controlled interest will pop right up. Subscribe, hit the bell notification to let us, to let you know when we upload new videos. Can't really trust YouTube sub boxes. They're a little fickle on Twitter. You can follow us collectively at CTRL INT. That's controlled interest abbreviated. You can follow Dom individually at Dom Zorios and you can follow me at Jared underscore. Still haven't gotten the underscore taken away yet. That guy's still holding on to that count, even though he hasn't tweeted in five years. But I'm trying. I'm trying. Uh, in terms of iTunes, uh, you can go over there, leave us a five star review, uh, or a four star, three star, anything other than that. Just you know, go somewhere else. Uh, but, the, <laughs> but the reviews help us move up in the algorithm. Let us get seen more by more people, which is always great. We want the show to grow because the more the show grows, the better it gets for all of us included. And we're on Spotify. Uh, happened about a month ago. Thankfully, the process there of acceptance it took a little longer than i expected but spotify seems like the case for everybody getting your podcast on there so you can find us there as well Uh, the link for that's in the description down below if you're watching on youtube or you can just go to our social medias it'll be there as well thank you guys for listening to episode 184 we'll catch you guys next week see you guys then bye